Hello everyone, this is Amir from Audio Science Review. Uh, we're back to basics today on a concept and terminology that I'm sure you've heard a ton about, uh, and that's uh, blind testing and control testing in audio. Um, it was uh, The video was prompted by someone uh, sending me this uh, video by uh, Paul McGowan from uh, uh, PS Audio and uh, where he talked about how he does plenty of blind testing and that uh, the future of the company depends on him getting it right. And unfortunately, in the process of explaining how he does blind testing, it's very clear that he doesn't understand the reason and methodology and uh, um, proper methodology to perform such tests. Um, prior to this, we had also Danny from GR Research talking about his uh, cables and how they're uh, amazing cables and that he can pass blind tests easily and that um, he would uh, produce such a video for us actually showing us his blind testing, which he unfortunately never done, uh, even though it's been a good few months since he uh, made that uh, promise. Um, I'm not trying to complain about them, but I, I do get rubbed the wrong way when people in the industry claim to A, know uh, what they're talking about, and, and B, uh, just have no knowledge of th the topic they're talking. Uh, it's one thing for individual audiophiles to not, not understand the nature of these tests. It's entirely another when you have a company, you have resources, you have money, and and uh, as Paul said, uh, you know, the future of your company may depend on it, uh, that you want to understand these things and, and do it right. So let me tell you up front, the punchline is that nothing they're doing is valid. Uh, no results they're generating is useful. Uh, they're really wasting their own time uh, doing those tests. But uh, let's get into it. And I'm going to cover this sort of A to Z independent of just, you know, the mistakes they've made. Let me start at top level, and, and really this goes to the heart and the mission of what we do on Audio Science Review, and which is to produce reliable results in whatever we do, whether I'm reviewing equipment or I'm listening to something. What is the point of producing something where I tell you X is you know, equal to W, but it's not a reliable thing? You need to be able to demonstrate that what you're saying is true beyond just spitting out an opinion. And uh, if there's also not reliable, don't say it um, uh, on this thing. So this is key thing. Anybody can do any kind of test, generate any kind of result. But if it's not reliable, if it's not dependable, it's of no value. It's remarkable how many people get this wrong online and reviews and in this case, industry people. So let me step back and say there's a the proper terminology in here is not a blind test. It's, it's a control test. Um, blindness is just one of the things, that, one of the tools we have to build a control test. What is a control test? In a control test, we're trying to isolate everything uh, else that is uh, interfering with the results that we want. In case of audio, our number one goal is, is fidelity, and we may be comparing two products against each other. And uh, the main thing is the sound that comes out of these audio devices, right? Uh, whether, you know, whether they look different or price different or design different, all of that is secondary information, which unfortunately can pollute and bias the listener and have them vote improperly and incorrectly. If the only thing that matters are your ears and what you're hearing, then we need to create tests where that's, all you, that's the only sensory input you're getting because all other sensory input are non-audible aspects of the test and we don't want those interfering because the moment they do, we're not talking about just the sound anymore. We're talking about a combination of things that, uh, uh, that just you know, not useful. Um, and uh, I don't need to tell you that, you know, this this is a standard protocol that's used in, in everything uh, out there where people want to get reliable results uh, on this thing. Medicine, of course, a prime example, but even taste tests uh, uh, on this thing and, you know, food and, and drinks and what have you. Um, as I alluded to a little earlier, uh, blindness is one aspect of, of the developing such a controlled test. And by blinding, we take away the identity of what you're listening to. And that is so, so important because 
you know, no matter who you are, you can be influenced by, um, you know, the shape, size, brand, or more importantly, just literally cheat. You know, if I tell you this is a $10,000 deck and this is a $20 deck and, you know, you're inclined to say that $10,000 decks are better than $20 ones. If you know which is which, you know, all bets are off on this thing. So we uh, apply a blinding mechanism. And this doesn't mean literally blindfold, although that can be useful too. Um, but this is just one of the factors, and this is the most obvious factor everybody knows about, uh, although it's tricky to execute, um, but at least I, I think anybody watching this video probably has heard the term blinding and knows that it uh, you know, refers to not knowing the identity of, of what you're testing. Um, there are many ways we could do audio tests. Uh, the most uh, common one is um, that we're interested in is, uh, you know, you've got two devices. One is A, one is B, um, which is which. And uh, I play a sample for you and I say, you tell me if it's A or B. And uh, you could guess A, you could guess B, and that's called a forced choice. You can't say W, right? <laughs> There's only two devices and you get to vote one or the other. Uh, I may ask you to rate a sound quality from one to five, let's say. Uh, you could say three, you could say four, you could say one, you could say five, but you can't say 50. Um, in that case, there are multiple choice questions uh, in there. And uh, you could get lucky by guessing, right? If it's A or B and I present you with some sample, you could just get lucky. Um, or you could think you know, but you really don't, but your guess is correct. And we need to be able to tell whether you truly are hearing something versus just a random guess. Now, in your mind, again, you may be thinking you're 100% not guessing and so forth. But from our point of view, the rest of the world that wants to listen to your conclusions of what you're claiming to be, that this, this amplifier sounds better than this other amplifier, if you want the rest of us to believe, we can't be in your mind, right? All we can do is look at the results of your testing, and we need to be able to tell how reliable that, that test is. Um, if you go back to your days of being in school and taking exams with multiple choice, you guessed, right, when you didn't know the answer, and you were right. Um, one of the things that also happens in, in audio tests is that when a person doesn't know the answer, usually they don't give up. They just sort of vote randomly. You just say, oh, look at that's A, that's B, that's C. Okay, I can't tell. I'm just randomly going to guess. So we need to find out about all of this, you know, at some point. Because, again, if we don't find these aspects in somebody's testing, then we don't know how reliable the results are, and therefore we can't trust it or, or count on it. Now, what I'm going to explain to you is aimed at you individually, whether you're Paul or, you know, Danny or, you know, any, anybody who's watching this, you're applying an audio file, and you want to know the truth about audio. What is the truth about audio? Again, it's only the sound that you hear, not everything else that your brain knows about and, and can rely on. And uh, for that... Uh, there are two ways we could do this. You could do it in a friendly testing and the other one I call hostile testing. Mm -hmm. Hostile testing would be me going to Paul's facility and say, okay, Paul, you think you can tell the difference between this amp and this other amp? I'm going to run a test and I'm going to put in all these protocols and I'm going to be on the lookout for you uh, being able to tell what I'm doing and, and not telling me how something sounds, but you're cheating and looking for tells, as it's called. Um, this is not a presentation about that. That kind of protocol is, turns out to be very difficult to execute, and you need to have so many safeguards in there uh, to keep the person from cheating and getting reliable results. This one is, if at all, I've enticed you to uh, um, uh, to do a proper objective test of you know, by listening of audio equipment and learn for yourself whether they are or there aren't any differences. So that's the aim of the rest of this presentation. Uh, you know, doing it for formal research, publishing papers and so forth, that requires far more than what I'm going to talk about, although the core principles are the same. But in this case, I'm just teaching you what to do in, in, um, uh, taking a test and generating reliable results, which you can, by the way, come and then say on a forum or a YouTube comment, say, hey, I've taken this test and here are my results and have people say, aha, okay, those are something we can pay attention to rather than 
I listen to this amp, the other one, one has better sound stage than the other one, and this one has, you know, harsher highs or whatever, that kind of thing, we just dismiss out of hand because, again, it's not a controlled test. So, um, we need to make a test blind, right? That's the first thing we talked about. And the key thing in here is not knowing which is which. And if you can't do this, then don't bother, right? We've got to avoid, if you're testing two different things and comparing them, we've got to hide these things. Um, one way to do it is, is to use an electronic switcher of some sort and an AB switcher, and, uh, you, and you don't know which one is A and which one is B, have somebody else come connect the cables, you know, let's say testing cables, and then you can flip A and B. A lot of people will say, whoa, you know, I don't want to have a switch in the path in there, that could add its own distortion, fine. Have somebody that you in your household or friend or loved one, uh, you know, switch these cables. You can turn your back and have them switch it, and then you know, then you can listen to the system, and uh, um, you know, and write down, you know, and, and you know, listen, and then, and then pass a judgment on it. The key here is to avoid any tells. And tells is just you know something that basically gives away, gives that away. Uh, you're doing this testing for your own good. You're trying to learn something. Don't fool yourself. Don't try to cheat. Uh, the temptation is high when you're taking these tests and you get frustrated. It's, ah, maybe I could tell one was a little louder or whatever. Um, but the whole point of this thing is you've got to not be able to tell the identity of these things. But again, I'm hoping that you know what blinding means in general. The next one is familiar to many people also, uh, although executing it correctly is, is, is not easy. Um, we've got to match levels. Uh, levels have this incredible effect where you can literally enhance the fidelity of one device versus the other, even if they're 100% identical by having one be slightly louder. What does the loudness do? Loudness lets you hear lower uh, notes that decays into nothing. If the volume is low after, you know, let's say it's a piano note or a guitar pick and go ding and goes into noise floor and disappears at some point. But if I have a higher level, then it takes it longer to decay down. And that's an, an example of something that's very enjoyable, uh, a, you know, bass that's impactful, that's louder, and, you know, and kicks harder. Uh, if it's louder, then it's, it's going to sound good uh, until it gets distorted, then it does the reverse. But assuming it's not getting distorted, I can't tell you how many times I have fallen prey to this, despite everything I know. If I don't get the levels 100% right, I'm listening to an NAB test, I'm like, gosh, it sounds... Uh, you know, better than the other one, and then I measure levels, notice that that was louder. As soon as I compensate, it's like all of a sudden the door closes on you and that difference vanishes so remarkably. And you turn up the volume and all those characteristics that you're reading, subjective reviews come to life. Everything sounds more alive, details get better, uh, noise floor goes down because there's more accentuation in the dynamic range. So absolutely critical that you have to match levels and unfortunately this is a bit technical uh, on this thing and uh, I'll talk about it in a second but uh, you've got to do this if you can't do this then don't do the test and this is one of the things that Paul did wrong in his tests um, where he didn't talk about matching levels at all fortunately a lot of the blind tests you can do without worrying about levels and that's what I call the easy case in here where uh, oops uh, where uh, the, uh, the device themselves or what you're testing doesn't either impact the uh, um, the uh, levels, power cables or, you know, tweaks or, you know, stands or footers or there are a lot of things that basically cannot and will not change levels. Now, it's good to also check levels anyway. It is, but, uh, you know, it's, it's not always necessary uh, to, to match levels to uh, two digital cables, uh, two, uh, uh, I was going to say two streamers, but streamers can also resample audio and things like that. So it's a remote chance levels may change. But maybe you're lucky, and a lot of the fights we have in audio is around things that are basically impossible for them to make any change, and, and they're really not changing levels. So even if you think you're, they're changing levels, so I personally would be okay if you have this class of device and you don't say anything about level matching uh, because the you know if the levels are changing then game's over <laughs> they did make a difference on this thing now 
if it's uh, two different devices where uh, levels could be different, two different decks, there's no standards in digital uh, to analog converters, preamps. In audio in general, we don't have many standards that people stick to for levels. It's easily easy to find two DACs that one outputs 4.4 volts, the other one outputs 3.9 volts. Or even more extreme, it's a core DAC that puts out 3.5 volts or something like that that nobody uses. But if you compare it to a DAC that puts out two volts, well, clearly this is going to sound a lot louder than the other one. Uh, now, on these things, they're also the divides into two categories. Some of them you can level match, uh, and I'll talk about how you could do that, but some of them you cannot easily level match. Uh, I often do headphone amp tests, and I get a tube amp which has a high output impedance. The problem with a tube amp or any amp device with a high output impedance is that if you hook them up to a headphone that has variable frequency response, which is most headphones, the two interact, it actually changes the frequency response of the headphone. If it's going to do that, then what? how do you adjust levels? Maybe it just boosts the bass, but not the highs. Or maybe it mixes both of them. Some of the frequencies go down, some of them go up. There is no one thing that you can match. And I tell you, in those cases, it can be next to impossible to match levels. So how common are those tests? I don't know. But if you have a high output impedance device, be careful on that. So let's talk about the, the middle category, which is an easy way to test things. Um, you have two DACs, two preamps, two power amplifiers, something that you know can have variable outputs. Um, somehow find a way to run a test tone and you can download test tones from the web and or use programs like Room EQ Wizard and create tones in there. A fidelity of it is not critical whatsoever. So if you have a laptop or tablet, whatever, you could just hook up an analog output of, out of it or headphone out, headphone dongle. It's really not critical. Take that cable and hook it up to, uh, to your system and um, Play the two devices, and if they have volume controls, adjust their volume controls till they match. Uh, if they don't have volume controls, then it gets a lot more complicated, and I'm not going to dig into that. But you got to find a way to adjust this. Now, how do you measure it? You can buy a multimeter, uh, and these multimeters are as cheap as uh, $30, $40 for a half decent one. And... Um, uh, make sure you use a low frequency. I'll pick 200 hertz here. There's nothing magical about that, but don't go much above that. Many of these uh, multimeters, especially cheap ones, have limited bandwidth, so um, and it can be a little bit unpredictable in what they measure above their uh, bandwidth. So pick a lowish frequency and, and run it, and, and you basically put it in AC range and uh, hook it up to the output of your devices, you know, test one, measure that. It doesn't matter what it is. Let's say it's an amplifier, measure 6.2 volts. Okay, take it out and hook it up to the other one and measure 6.2 volts. Uh, make sure you don't short things out. Amplifiers should have protection circuit, but that's the one device you could damage uh, if, if you don't know what you're doing. Um, with amplifiers, you could also use acoustic matching where you can use a microphone and, and then you don't have that issue, but that gets more involved on this thing. Um, one word of advice, after you do this matching, play some music and do the A-B test, make sure to sound similar to you. Uh, I've done this and then, like I said, in the case of high impedance devices, I go play some music, some of them sound like the level's matched, then I play others and the level's not matched. So make sure subjectively, which is the test we're going to run with our ears, make sure they do sound similar in level uh, on this thing. If they're not, then that's not good. Um, things get a little bit more complicated um, if you want to do these tests properly. And a proper one, the science says you want to have a fast ability to switch from one to the other. And, and I'll talk about the improper way for you in a second. But the proper way is how do you have two simultaneous things playing? Uh, if you're testing two preamps or two power amplifiers or whatever, those are analog devices and you can get splitter cables and split the signal. Uh, by the way, on all these things, if you run into problems, just post on a forum, whether it's audio science review or any other, people will help you with these things. 
Um, testing uh, digital devices is more complicated. Um, let's say we want to test two DACs. Um, there's a great tool on Windows I use, which is my Rune, R-O-O-N, Media Play Rune, that I use. And it has this multi-zone capability where you could have as many DACs as you want, and you can group them together, and then you can play the same content to all of them. And that works very well for testing two DACs. So I can take two DACs, gang them up together, and then I, anything I play, it gets, it gets fed to both of them and I can then have an AB switch on the output of the DAX and listen to them and if the DAX have volume controls I adjust their volumes and if they don't in software and Rune I can adjust their volume uh, Rune lets you have independent volume controls there too and uh, makes a very difficult job doable um, now there are people who don't believe in this fast AB switching and they think they should spend hours and days and weeks and months listening to one sample then listen to the other one no problem there's no requirement in control testing that anything be done fast um i don't recommend that you spend days do listen to one then the other <laughs> it'll take you a long time to finish this task but surely if the difference is available to you night and day as people always say oh i listen to one DAC is grainy i listen to this cable so much better background than everything well if it's that obvious then you don't need days to listen to it right you know but you're welcome to do a daily listening test uh you know, listen to one of them for a day and then listen to the other one for another day. In that case, you're just switching gear and just get a friend to uh, or a loved one to come and, and do the switching for you so it's blind. So you don't know today, on Monday, you have uh, DAC A or cable A playing and the next day could be A again or it could be B and uh, you basically, you know, once a day you're listening to one or the other. But you know that science has conclusively proven that when you do that, you're really screwing yourself. There's no way you're going to remember what the sound was like, uh, you know, five minutes ago, literally, <laughs> versus, you know, one day or five days. But control testing and blind testing doesn't dictate this. A lot of people say, well, blind testing says I got to do it quickly. It doesn't. It take all the time in the world and the results will be just as valid from point of view of it, running a control test. This is the reason I actually made the, this presentation, this slide. Up to here, a lot of you knew uh, uh, what I was going to talk about. But this is the part that I find that most people don't understand. And if you don't do this, unfortunately, the results are no good at all. You could match levels. You could do everything else I said. If you don't do this, you're, it's wrong. Remember I talked about how we need to tease out whether you're guessing or whether you're confused, whether you couldn't really tell because the, you know, the answer is always multiple choice on these things. It, the, the answer to that is statistical analysis. And to have statistical analysis of anything, we need to have more than one sample. If I flip a coin and I predict that it's going to be head, and it's head, does that mean that I can predict the outcome of a, any coin flip? The answer is no. That was a lucky guess, right? Let's repeat that five times. I flipped the coin five times. What if I get all five times right? Does that mean that I can predict that? Answer is actually no. For that to be correct, you need to get a little over eight out of 10 times right before we have 95% confidence that the outcome is reliable. So if you're comparing two cables, comparing two DAX, two amps, or two of anything, the classic AB test, then you want to run the test minimum of 10 times. The more you do, the better the statistics are. But for my sake, if you ran it 10 times and you got nine of them right, good enough for an online internet argument to come and say, look, I tested these two things and nine out of 10 times, my guess was correct of which one I was listening to. You get that, that's cause enough for us to stand back and say, whoa, there may be something here. Let's repeat the test. Let's see if we get the same thing. But if you come out and say, hey, I can walk into a room, listen to these two things. Instantly, I can tell which one's A, which one's B. That means zero, means nothing. <laughs> Even if you did it twice, it means nothing. It means three times. And this is Danny Rich's mistake in his video. Of, oh, I can walk in instantly tell which cable is which. Well, you know, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Uh, first of all, we weren't even there to know 
that you guess they think correctly. Um, one of the things about statistics is that you need to keep a log, you need to keep track, and, it, and that is the documentation that we need. So a lot of times somebody says, I pass a blind test and so right, can you explain the protocol and documentation? They're like, no, I just did it blind and I could tell. Like, no, show us a log like this that says, hey, First time I got it right, second time I got it right, third time I didn't, fourth time I did, fifth time I did, sixth time I did. And uh, then we can see, we can see a log and gives us some confidence to us that, uh, that you got it right. So this sounds like a very high number, but personally, I like to get 99% or 100% right, actually. I don't even want to leave 5% to chance. So I'll often take a test where I get 24 out of 25 times uh, correct. And then I know. And then why is the one time wrong? Because, you know, sometimes you're voting A and B, you forget or you get distracted when the differences get small. It's very hard. And I've shown you previous uh, examples of that where if you take an automated uh, test like uh, FUBAR's APX test, it will actually generate the statistics for you and you'll immediately see that getting four out of five right doesn't do you any good. And by the way, where does this come come out? This is just basically, you can guess A or B, so you have 50% chance of being right. Probability is 0.5. You get it twice, two times in a row right is 0.5 times 0.5. And you got to keep multiplied by 0.5 till the, the probability of being uh, guessing drops below 0.05, which is five, and this is called P greater than five, uh, P less than five uh, percent or 0 0.05 is what we want. Um, if the test is is for preference test, uh, where you're rating the fidelity of speaker, then then it's not a simple game like this. You got to understand what you're doing, and the best thing you can do is just post the results to Audio Science Review. Somebody recently did this, and I and others that understand how to do the statistical uh, ANOVA analysis that it's called, and we run it, and then we can actually tease out. You know, even though everybody's just rating all these speakers against the music they listen to, you can actually tease out the uh, probability of chance uh, very easily out of those things. So there's good tools to do that. But I'm not going to get into how you do that. You need to really have a you know a good background in statistics to understand. Now, go and get any paper uh, from. Uh, audio engineering society in case of audio, but also any medical research, any others. And you'll see that the testing part is really like half the paper or one third of the paper. The other two thirds is full of statistical analysis. In this case, what I'm showing you is, is uh, research uh, from Sean Olive, Dr. Sean Olive on uh, preference tests in here. And it's just a random paper that I took. And you can see all the statistical analysis that's going on in here. And, and not just one test, they'll run many, many statistic tests to find that, for example, maybe people prefer the speaker uh, with certain tracks of music uh, or with all the music uh, or listener types, male versus female, old versus young and so forth. So you can really dice and divide the results and, and get a lot of insight out of the test um, on this thing. So when somebody tells me that they just walked in, did one or two tests, tells me that they've never ever seen a single piece of research paper in audio uh, listening test to have thought that one or two iterations was good enough to say that they, oh, they can, I can pass a blind test. And how embarrassing is that, that you're in an industry, that you're building products, that you talk about fidelity, that you talk about blind testing, that you haven't even seen or read one paper because you can't escape this. Every paper that has a blind test in it has multiple iterations in statistical analysis. Every one of them, without exception, from simpler paper to the journal papers that are peer reviewed that go on for uh, 50 pages. They all do. So when a person says, ah, I know it all, I'm sorry, you know nothing about this. You've got to go back to basics. Audio Engineering Society costs two or $300 a year to join. The papers cost, I think it used to cost seven bucks. Maybe some of them are a little bit more now. But if you're running a company, you can't afford to spend two or $300 a year to get an AES subscription and download a few papers. Just go in there and search for blind test control tests. And tons will pop out and you'll see this stuff. And if you don't understand the statistics, well then either go learn it or stop claiming that you're running blind tests.
on this thing. So, I've talked about this earlier. Um, if you want to do this test, then you want to do it eight or 10 times. My suggestion is, uh, you know, if it's something you do in longer term, is to keep to keep two logs. Whoever is doing this switching, uh, have them uh, keep a log and make sure that sometimes they switch, sometimes they don't. There's random number generators on the fo online that you can use and create a sequence of A, B, and it could be A, 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 B, 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 A, B, A, whatever. It should be randomized. If it's not randomized, you're actually violating some of the principles and statistics that lets us do the math and figure out the probabilities in there. So you should randomize that. And so they keep a log, and let's say you're doing the test for 10 days in a row or or 10 times in a row, they have their cheat sheet and you take a, cheat, a log and you write down your answers. And at the end, you compare the two and see how many you got right. And uh, if you didn't get uh, nine out of 10 right, I'd say, you know, you just learned something uh, important about audio that you didn't know. Now, this gets confused also. Danny Ritchie in his video says double blind tests of speaker cables are impossible because the person doing the cable switching will know what he's switching. Therefore, it's impossible to run a double blind test. And the people who say you should run double blind tests are stupid. Well, first of all, let's talk about where did this double blind test and the need for that come from. Um, Google Clever Hans, and uh, you'll land in a Wikipedia page with a very interesting story about this horse uh, in Germany whose name was Clever Hans. And a Clever Hans could do math, not just simple math, it could do very complicated, solve logic problems. Uh, you could ask him, you know, what date was, uh, I don't know, Tuesday uh, uh, in March or something, and the, the, the horse would pound his hoof you know, a count and it would stop at that. So if it was ninth day of March, you would pound the hoof nine times and after nine times would stop. And uh, this was so magical and they took the horse everywhere and uh, and would uh, the owner would show all these tricks, uh, you know, multiply three by two and do it, they would, the horse would do it six times. And uh, it was quite a puzzle to, uh, uh, men of science yeah, on how this was possible. So a uh, psychologist um, uh, studied this and uh, ran a bunch of control tests and realized that the only time that the horse could tell, uh, could give the right answers was when his trainer or his owner was there if you took away the owner and asked the questions, the horse couldn't get any of the right answers. And he realized what was happening was that the horse was watching the owner and the owner was making involuntary gestures when the right answer was given by the horse. So the horse, let's say the answer is four, and the horse would do one, two, three, four. That's soon as you give the right answer, involuntarily the owner would change its, uh, you know, what he was doing and the horse was able to read that and it would stop uh, the, uh, you know, pounding of his hoof. And uh, that was enough to, uh, uh, for it to get all the right answers. So uh, this is, gets us to this, uh, what's called Clever Hans effect. And this is basically why single blind tests are no good because if you are conducting a test, you could have this uh, communication, uh, in this case it was an verbal communication with a person, or in this case an animal, taking a test and you convey the answer to them. So let's say I am having you test DAC A versus DAC B, and uh, I have DAC A I'm playing, and I say, now let's listen to DAC B. <laughs> by raising my eyebrows. And if I, you know, always do that, then you, you sort of, uh, you know, I phrase the question wrong, but essentially if I always do, you know, something like this, or I roll my, you know, my arm some certain way. And even if I'm not doing it on purpose, um, I could convey the uh, answer to you, which is which, and we don't want to do that. So the solution to this is double blind, which means that in this case, instead of the owner and trainer, uh, asking, you know, being there, you have a, you know, have him be behind the horse and the horse can't see it. And, uh, 
Now, performing double blind tests, it gets very difficult, like Danny said, how are you having somebody switch cables that, uh, you know, where they don't know what cables are switching, you know, you can't blindfold them and have them switch cables. You actually probably could if you made it easy enough. Mm -hmm. uh, you could make an electronic AB switch that's automatically switching uh, under computer control, so that becomes, you know, uh, random. Or in my case, I actually don't care if you go to that rigorous of standard. Remember, this is for your own learning. This isn't to publish something. So as far as I'm concerned, if you have a loved one come in and switch A to B, and then they walk out of the room, and then you turn and listen to your system, that's fine that they knew, as long as they didn't communicate anything to you. So that's the key thing, making sure whoever's doing this switching for you, whether you know if it's a computer is done for you, if it's a person, just make sure they don't communicate anything to you. And if we have to literally double blind, uh, uh, put a blinders on you, we could also do that. Then you can't see. It's key that there are no sounds. You know, somebody's plugging a cable and it sounds different than the other. Again, don't try to fool yourself. These are for friendly tests. If it's a hostile test, we have to do a lot more. Um, so. I'm happy with single blind test with the intent that is doing what a double blind test would do. It's not an excuse to not do any testing uh, because you can't do double blind. And understand that this is the nuance between single and double blind. Don't call everything double blind. I have people say, I do double blind tests all the time. And when they explain it, it's clear they've done a single blind test, so it's not a double blind test. Um, a simple thing I do is that when I'm testing equalization, for example, I you know close my eyes and I have my you know, mouse on, on the uh, uh, on off button. And I just hit it many, many times till I lose track of which one's which. Then I just switch A and B, A and B, A and B with my eyes closed. And then I open my eyes and see it. So that's not a proper double blind test, but it's good enough for the purposes that we have in here. Um, just quick some FAQs before we finish. Uh, people said blind tests are stressful. Uh, they they are if you've said you know run water runs uphill and I'm not testing you and you can't prove that yeah it can be very stressful but these tests are for you to run uh, so you're doing it in your home if you can't tell at the end you are confused you don't have to tell a single person. Uh, it's for your own sake, and so therefore it doesn't have to be stressful. I do a ton of these blind tests myself because I want to know before I go write something and embarrass myself, I run the test and there's nothing stressful about it. Yes, it's, a, it's something you got to do, it takes some effort, but people put that effort in anyway. When they buy, uh, comparing two pieces of audio gear, they're already doing it. Uh, so might as well just add some rigor and some control to it uh, on this thing. So it's not stressful if it's not public. If it's public, yes, it's very stressful, but I have passed them. You know, uh, I've been challenged. Can you tell MP3 against Wave? And I said, fine, I'll take a piece of music and, you know, do the A-B test and I'll find the difference and I'll show it to them. And then sometimes I can't and I'm honest. I'm like, okay, you gave me four clips on two of them I couldn't tell. You know, but this other one I could. And uh, so, you know, there's goodness in them. You learn a lot about audio, by the way, by doing these A-B tests. Uh, you, you actually get become a better listener because you're not focusing to pass a control test where you know the results coming back at you, what the right answers are. The second criticism is that, you know, I can't do them too fast. Uh, you know, I, I want to, you know, it takes me a while to listen and, and you know, on, the, on something and as I've said before, take all the time you want in the world. Know that you're screwing yourself. Every test in the world has been done. The moment you let people get acclimated to stuff, differences shrink. And uh, even when we talk about speakers and things, the longer you wait, uh, the worse your detection becomes. But if you want to do that, go ahead. You know, we give you two weeks to come back, prove to us that the you know two cables sound different. Um, and the last one is the retort that we get all the time. My ears tell the truth, so I don't need to run any blind tests for you. And the answer is, great. Don't come and bother telling us about it then. <laughs> you know, if, you, if what you believe is good enough for you, that's fine. We're, we don't care what you tell yourself. We care what you want to come and tell us and what you want to push down our throat by saying, you better believe me that this, uh, this cable sounds better than the other one or this tag is better than that one. Okay, now you're making it our business. And if you're going to make it our business, we want reliable information. We want to know just what the sound was. We don't want to know the whole picture of what influenced your decision. We just want to know the sound on this thing. So 
get into the end, get used to talking about and asking people, we want control tests. When somebody comes in, just tells you, oh, I can tell these, you know, this is better than the other one. It doesn't sound plausible. Say, okay, can you give us a control test? And what is a control test? A control test that has reliable results, something that we can count on. And if you can't give that to us, then please don't waste our time. I get this every two or three days. Somebody comes in HR forum says, you're all wrong. I've got this Ethernet switch that sounds twice as good as this other Ethernet switch. It's like, you know, come on, don't, don't waste our time. You know, go tell that somebody else. You know, those of us who want reliable information, we want some proof point of what you're saying is important. We love you listening to the results of your ears. Your hearing is important to us, but you got to follow the protocols in, in, in here. Now, that a blind test is just a component. Just saying the test is blind doesn't make it good, doesn't make it useful. It's just one aspect. You got to tell us everything else. So the moment you come in, you say, oh, "I've got scientific results for you." Scientific result means walking through all this. Uh, you match levels this way. You control the setup this way. You um, you know test with blind, single blind. How you control all that? Where's the documentation? And where's the statistical results? All of that you need to present to us if something's not plausible before anybody cares on the side of the fence where we want to have valid results. On the side where people want to believe in fantasies, uh, yeah, don't even bother with any of this stuff. You go buy your, you know, whatever uh, Ethernet switch and change its power supply, tell the world it sounds even better now. More power to you, just don't bother telling it. the rest of us who go by logic and, and what we've been uh, taught in all sciences on this thing. You need to control volume. Uh, you need to have repetition on this thing. And above all, don't do this to go win challenges. Do it to learn yourself about your system and, and your knowledge of audio. There's so many myths you may be believing in. And when you run this test, all of a sudden the air clears and, you know, it literally is going to change your audio file life to do, a, to do this. Um, so I hope you know, those of you who are watching this video are not a believer in this. Some small percentage of you are are inclined to now to go do it. And you now at least know the, the, the things you got to get right. Maybe you don't know all the specifics. And again, come on the forum and ask. Uh, membership is happy to uh, guide you with all the details of what you're trying to do or warn you that's a very difficult test to run. But, uh, you know, whatever you do, you need to participate and do a few of these tests to really, really understand audio. If you've never done blind tests at all in your life, chances are you just haven't completed that journey yet. Okay, I hope you found this video useful. I know some of it was repetitious for uh, those of you who've been schooled in these things, but even for you, I hope there was something new in there. Okay, thanks for watching and see you in a future video. Bye-bye.